The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS licence nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hello, my name's James Wrigley. I'm a financial advisor and one of the principals of Melbourne-based financial planning firm, First Financial. I've been a long-term listener and contributor to the Ensemble Group and podcast, picking up some amazing nuggets of gold over the years. And through this podcast and the people that I'm able to speak to and interview, hopefully I can continue to deliver some of those nuggets of gold to you. Are you having conversations with clients about retirement? Are they asking how much money they'll need? Are they worried they'll run out? We're proud to introduce the new North Retirement Space on Ensemble, featuring Q&As with economists, webinars with product innovators, and unfettered access to retirement specialists to support your advice. Join the conversation today with North, a better way for retirement. Hey, welcome back to another episode of the podcast. I have the pleasure of speaking with David Orford today. Uh, David and I had a had a quick chat over the weekend about what we were going to cover today. The, the main the main topic of today's podcast is is going to be about uh, account based pensions with with longevity or the these kind of lifetime pensions that are that are starting to pop up from different product providers at the moment. We're going to talk about a bit about the history and and kind of the evolution of of that. But David, when we were chatting over the weekend, uh, as I just mentioned, you you're up to some really interesting projects. I, I would really like to start with maybe if you can tell the the listeners uh, kind of who you are, what you're up to, and we'll maybe go back a bit into your history before we get into the the topic of today being the lifetime pensions. David, thanks for joining me. Oh, thanks for having me, James. Um, yeah, what I'm currently working on is a, getting younger people access to housing. So I was involved in the housing policy of the Liberal Party at the last election, and I saw that um, young people making superannuation contributions is not a good thing because early in life you want to have a good time. You want to run around on the beach. You want to go overseas, get a car, get a bike, go out, just have a good time while you're fit and healthy. You also want to find a partner and buy an engagement ring and put a deposit down on a house. So by having 11% of their pay put aside to something that's not going to happen for 45 or 50 years is just a silly thing. There's plenty of time left later in life when the kids have grown off your hands to do that. Yes. So currently there's a Senate inquiry running on this very topic and I've been asked to do a bit more. So the things I'm working on are the first home super saver scheme. Yes. Not many people know about that, but it's a really good scheme for helping people get a house deposit. And I'm also working on HEX because young people like me, when I was young, I went to university and had to pay off X. So that takes somewhere between 2 and 10% for really high income owners out of your pay to pay off the debt. Now, why should that occur immediately? Why can't it be deferred a bit? Because then people would be able to save for a home deposit. And homes are really important because they're geared. You can't gear super, but you can gear a home. Yeah. So you can control an asset five times larger and the, you'll be much, much better off. You'll save rent and all that sort of stuff. So that's just a few of the things I've been working on. Yeah. And so you're, you're an actuary, is it? Right? Is you're an actuary by trade or description, is it? Yeah. I forgot that right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Um, and, and have you always yeah, been in and around the kind of super system? Yeah, I've worked in every area of actuarial endeavour, you know, general insurance, someone involved in the work, workers' compensation review going on now. Uh, it's a mind of wood. What did you say? That? It, it's, a, it's a minefield? Yeah, it, it really is. It's um, so many interests and we need to get people back to work and play as soon as we possibly can. That's for their benefit. And so there's so many things that stand in the way of that. But during my life... I've been designing lifetime annuities for life insurance companies and super funds, so I probably designed more than anybody else. And when I was designing them, I realised the pitfalls in the current annuity design. In if you want to provide a CPI indexed annuity for a life insurer, a manufacturer, there's a huge amount of risk involved. One is the longevity risk because people 
are living longer. So for every year that goes by, we live about 15% of a year longer. So if you take the difference between us and our parents, say it's 20 years, we will leave, live three years on average longer than them. And that, the increases in longevity will continue because medical research is continuing and we will solve far more things in future and will live even longer still. The other deficiency with the existing annuities is the asset liability mismatching risk in that you can't get to invest assets that exactly match your liability. Liability goes out for 40 years from 65 to maybe 108, I think it is, on the Australian life tables now. So they're sort of dangerous things. And what I wanted was to design a lifetime annuity that didn't carry any, that sort of risk. For the manufacturer. Yeah. 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 And so here we, so they, you know, we've had um, you know, lifetime annuities around for for a period of time. And I was in a, I was asked to be a, kind of a, a guest along at an event of a few weeks back. And the question was put to me and a couple of other financial advisors on the couch to say, we you know, using annuities in the original sense, uh, and 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 me and a few others uh, kind of said no, not not really, particularly given the drop in interest rates that had happened over the you know the last decade or so, when you all the the hundred percent asset exemption disappeared, then we had a fifty percent asset exemption, and, and then you throw in the really low interest rates and kind of locked in really low interest rates. The appeal wasn't wasn't really there. Do you have a sense of what? The uptake of annuities, the the traditional type of annuity, has been over the last decade or so. Do you have any insight into that? Uh, oh yeah, it's really disgusting. Yeah. It's less than two percent of retirees. Yeah, right. And the reason it's disgusting is because the people that don't take annuities take lump sums, and they do things like go overseas and buy new cars and upgrade their houses, and they spend the money. The money's there to for them to have an income for the rest of their lives, but not afterwards. You can't yeah. take it with you. <laughs> and when they fall back on the age pension, guess who pays for it? A taxpayer. That's you, that's you and me. We pay for older people that are sucking up the age pension. And my generation, the baby boomer generation, we're sucking it up. We're costing the government far more because we're, there's so many of us and we're just living longer than ever before on the age pension. Thanks very much to younger people paying the tax. So, head, so, so not, the annuity was invented by the Romans. It's about it's the oldest financial product in the world. Probably older than banking, I'm not too sure. But they've been around for a long time, but they're the ideal product. So the, we are quoting low interest rates, but think in terms of investment return, you can invest in an account-based pension and get solid investment returns. It's not an interest rate, it's an investment return. Yes. So the new breed of annuities are account-based pensions with longevity protection. And there are several types. There's the, the real annuity, there's a CDC, or, uh, or there's a GSA. GSA is probably the popular one for super funds, so that that's run by... Um, the uh, what well, the former Q Super, but other other super funds are doing the GSA type. Yep. So what what what's the GSA type? Can you elaborate on that? Yeah. What it, what it is? Um, people st people uh, join a pool. So as they retire, they move across into the pool, and they stay in that pool. Now, if the pool uh, it looks after its own mortality risk, it's not insured in any way. So as you move along through time, you'll find people will live either longer or shorter than they're meant to. If people live shorter, in other words, people die off relatively quickly, they leave their money behind for the survivors. So if there's more deaths than you expect, then the income for the survivors will go up. But conversely, if the pool is composed of people that live a long time, then the income will be pressed downwards. So that's that's why, look, it's a good scheme, but the, the probably better ones, and that's when you add longevity protection to it. Yeah. And so how, did, how does the longevity protection 
come about? Like, what, what what's the other style of these kind of you know lifetime pensions that are that are around? Yeah, that well, you know how you take out insurance during your life to make sure if you if you die, uh, you've got money for your children to grow up and your spouse to look after themselves. But in the other the converse of that, the mirror image is. If you live a long time, you will run out of money if you take an, a traditional account-based pension. You know that's a disastrous thing. So, people that live longer than their life expectancy, and half of us do, uh, it means that we'll start to draw down on our money, and we'll, we might run down, and we might run out of assets, and we might run down of income. But if you add insurance to that, there's a an insurer standing behind that, and they. So the way um, one of these annuities works is that. Let me give you a simple example. Say you have a hundred thousand dollars, sixty-five, married. You put your money into a pool. Your unit price is a dollar, and you buy six thousand units because the annuity effect is about fifteen to say. So you will get six thousand units. For the rest of your life, the units stay the same over time. And what's happening is the insurer is picking up the shortfalls and funding them and taking the small excesses out of the pool. So they're ensuring that no matter how long you live, you will continue to get 6,000 units cancelled every year for the rest of your life. And those units, a bit, bit like an account based pension units, they go up in value. So it's not the traditional CPI index, it's a more different type of investment type product. And here's where the planner comes in because with a traditional annuity, a planner is not really needed after it starts. But with this, the planner is because you can switch between investment options. If you think the market's going down, you advise your client, hey, look, I think the market's a bit toppy at the moment good to take some of your assets out of the equity market and maybe put it into the fixed interest market or conversely. So the planner is still required and uh, that's probably a good thing for the person because people need um, estate planning advice as well. Um, there's all sorts of things and children taking advantage of their parents, how do we counter that? There's lots of things that a planner can still get involved in post-retirement and by somebody having a investment link to a lifetime annuity that there's still a role for the planner to play so that that investment you, you mentioned about you you know your six thousand of your units get cancelled each year as you're you know kind of running down your capital or, or, or such over over time if i'm then switching the investment options i go from the share fund to the cash fund to the international fund whatever i'm whatever i'm doing how does that then interact with this idea of units that are being cancelled over time. Can you can you explain how that works? Well, it's the same way as an account-based pension. Say you were getting 6,000 units cancelled and you said you thought they were equity, equity-based units, you wanted to come out of that. So you wanted to take um, half of those, say um, 3,000 of them, say the unit price is still a dollar, you get 3,000 Dollars, but that's an income three thousand a year of income. Yes. You move them across to another unit type. Say the unit type has got a unit price of two dollars, then you will get fifteen hundred units of that unit type, and so it'll be the calculation will be fifteen hundred units times the two dollars. That three thousand would be cancelled every year in the future although the unit price will go up, so there'll be more, hopefully. So there'll be more more money available. Worth more. Yeah, okay. So really, it's, it, it's just the same as a unit trust, except that it's not an asset, it's an income. You're changing from one to another. Yep, yep. And so you were involved with the... We were talking over the weekend, you were explaining that you were involved in some way, shape, or form, with this kind of this new legislation, or I call it new, you, you you enlightened me that it's been around for a number of years now. But can you can you talk about your involvement with this? Yeah, um, I guess it was a fair while ago. But when I was about twenty six, I thought I'm going to retire 
on a CPI indexed annuity. That's the right product for me because <laughs> I'll get the income for the rest of my life. I'll use up all my capital. When I'm gone, there'll be nothing left. That'll be great. I'll use it all. It sounds like a good, then, <laughs> good actuary, <laughs> deciding yeah, that at 26 right. years old. <laughs> yeah, but when I started to design them for life insurance companies, I realized the deficiency. And then I read a World Bank report um, uh, in about 2011. But I'd started before then, but the World Bank report was the World Bank advises countries so the World Bank says, okay, here's some different types of lifetime products. Here's an account-based pension. Here's a lifetime pension. Here's a capital guaranteed lifetime pension. And here's taking it out as cash. So the advice to countries was to look after your citizens well. In other words, make sure that each citizen in their retirement has got enough money to last them for the rest of their lives. So they evaluated the different product types, but the World Bank didn't come down and say, this is a better product type. They're just saying these are different um, different attributes to each product type. But in the story, they mentioned four countries where 80% of people voluntarily purchased lifetime pensions at retirement, and there were different reasons. So the first two were Sweden and Denmark. Okay, they're smaller countries than us, but the unions decided that in their negotiations with the employers, hey, look, we want X percent of our pay put into a super fund. Now, next demand is we want our members to be on lifetime pensions when they retire. Well, the unions were protecting their members in retirement. They were actually wanted to 100% reinsure their longevity risk. The employers said, "No, we couldn't care less. You go and do. You go and do that." So the unions ran a uh, a survey. They selected a panel of life insurers, and their members started to take lifetime annuities or pensions when they retired. So the rest of the country, the government saw what they were doing, the non-government employees saw what the unions had done, and they all said, we're going to have some of that too. <laughs> so now it's gone from like 26% coverage to about 80% in those two countries. In other countries, in um, Switzerland, the government mandated annuity rates, and they said, we want to have a viable annuity market because we'll look after our citizens in retirement. And here are the annuity rates. Well, they didn't consult with the industry, but the rates were pretty good. And 80% of Swiss people took out these lifetime annuities. Now, the fourth country was Chile. They were advised by um, one of my friends who used to work for Senator Nick Sherry. And uh, Peter went there and the he said, look, you want people to be on pensions. You want it there to ensure their longevity. So just tax the lump sum just a little bit. So they tax the lump sums a few percent, and th then people sort of woke up. So they, 80% 80, 80 of them at the time this was written, take lifetime pensions. So my involvement has been trying to get the government to change the rules. And the rule change is simple. It's really... In the existing or the old legislation, it said an annuity is something which lasts for life and you have the same dollar amount or it increases with inflation. And what I wanted was this lifetime annuity or pension lasts for life and you pay out the same number of units every year. So all I was doing was substitute units for the word dollar. Yep. Now, a woman called Kelly O'Dwyer I never talked to Kelly O'Dwyer, but I talked to people in her office. She just took the recommendations of a financial system inquiry and started doing it. The system inquiry, like all the others before it, said, we want a viable market for lifetime income streams in Australia you know, to protect their citizens in their old age and so they don't run out of money. So she just started it. Um, and we, we didn't know. We just cottoned on. We worked with her office. We worked with the Treasury officials. And she passed the legislation on 1 July 2017. No firecrackers. 
no celebrations except from us because we knew what she'd done. Yeah. So that, that really freed up the market enormously. And it's only recently that people have gotten on that this is now available and man well, we can now manufacture far more efficient and far more effective lifetime annuities. Yep. So under the, the lifetime annuities at the moment, there's uh, special concessions around age pension and eligibility. You know, the, the asset value gets reduced by a certain percentage at different ages. Was that all tied up in the same same piece of legislation in 2017 or, or is it separate? Well, we didn't know that Kelly O'Dwyer was going to do this, but yeah. she put out a paper which we in the industry discussed and she said, um, we want to give a boost to lifetime products because they're the only things that are going to offset the cost of the age pension. Yeah. If people take lump sums or they burn up their income or their assets very quickly, it won't offset the age pension. And the whole point of superannuation is to offset. Why do you think we gave the tax concessions? We mm. gave the tax concessions so you would offset the cost of the age pension, and that's not happening. Yeah. So we need people to take lifetime annuities. So what she did on both assets and income, she only took 60% of each and threw them against the assets test and threw them against the income test. Yes. So the result being uh, that you, if you ha have an income that is payable for life, and it, you know really is payable for life, then you can get, I think it's up to 8 or 9% um extra income. Uh, actually, James, not to promote my book, but our book in Chapter 6 contains a number of examples that financial planners just really love to see. Yeah. So it shows if you take um, a lifetime pension or if you take an account-based pension, the amount of age pension that you get. So it's a, it's a little bit more, but the planners seem to be well aware of this, of this fact. Yeah, and so so that's all kind of wrapped up in the same thing. So then it's taken a, a few years for the product manufacturers to to come up with different products. And so then we've got is there is there two broad types? There's the the first one that you spoke about where you you're part of a pool, and then it depends on the mortality of the of the the people in that pool as to the the level of income that you earn. And then the other type is this more unitized product that you're referring to. That has a life insurance benefit is is, is they are they the two? Is there any other any other combinations that people have come up to in term come up with in terms of products? Yeah, well, there's the existing one which is you mentioned before with, with an interest rate. Yes. Um. So that that's like a fixed. I call it a fixed annuity. And at actuaries and financial planners, their minds are locked in there. So, yeah, they need right. to come out of the closet yeah. because it's a whole new world out there. Yeah. So there's only two life insurance companies that have developed real lifetime pensions or annuities. So life companies can only issue annuities. Super funds can only issue pensions, but they're they're the same product. Okay. So any two life insurers, I think AMP is not a life insurer anymore. Yeah. But it has got a similar product to a GSA, which they're telling me is doing really really well in the marketplace. Hmm. I think the Retirement Trust of Australia, the old Q Super, they've got a GSA. Yep. That was uh, the first one that I was aware of, yeah. Yep. But I guess the interesting thing, James, is that the government is really, really upset with the superannuation industry. <laughs> and, you know, I didn't know, I know the Liberal Party and uh, they were really trying to push this with a covenant, but the super funds backed off the covenant and said, well, we really don't want to do this. Yes, we'll have to set objectives, but we really don't want to offer lifetime pensions. Yes. Now, the Labor Party came in and they're, they're saying the same thing. So they're writing the, the arguments now. You super funds better start to look after your members in retirement because you're not doing a really good job now. I, I, I guess there was a study the other day that said, I think it was people, 80% of people who were aged 80 died and they'd ran, run out of money two years before they died. Yeah, right. And you think, that just shouldn't happen in a society like ours. That just shouldn't happen. How did, how did that happen? Yeah. And, and it's because they buy a caravan for their daughter, they give money for their son, sons or their grandchildren's education. They've got all this money there. 
But yes, but that money is needed for your income in the future. So people tend to run down on their assets if they can touch them. And they think, this is like winning tax a lot of all this money we've got in our super fund. It's the same kind of challenge. For, like I said, it's the same kind of challenge for people in their um, like in their in their working lives as you, you know, you're saving up money and paying off your home loan, or you've got money in this offset account. I'm sure there's people that have that have done studies that that suggest that the, the more access to money that you have, the more you tend to spend it, r- rather than yeah, think of the think of the future. And it's the same with the retirees. If they've got access to a lump sum of money. Yeah, you'd expect that they're more likely to spend more of that in the short term rather than thinking about the long term uh, and, and their and their longevity. Yeah, look, James, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, it's like having a lot of ice cream in the fridge. You think, I'll have a bit of that tonight and tomorrow night. And really, it's probably bad for you. <laughs> but, the, but there's been a study in the US that showed that people who have a real lifetime income, they spend more than people that aren't. So people who are on an account-based pension, they're not too sure whether the money's going to run out. Yes. And most of them follow the 4 5 6% rule under the account-based pension. They draw out the minimum. Yep. But even drawing out the minimum at later ages, I think the factors get up to 4 You've got to draw out 14%. Yeah, they get really it's, high, don't they? Yeah, and if you draw a graph of it in real terms, you'll find that... It get it's pretty. It stays the same in real terms up to a bit after life expectation, and then it declines fairly rapidly after that. Yeah. And you think, in a way, the government's designed it that way so that they get the maximum offset offset against the age pension on that cohort of people that starts at a hundred percent and runs down to fifty percent. Yeah. So that that's a large amount of people. And they offset it as much as they possibly can. But in the next fifth, when it goes from fifty to naught, the offset isn't as great. Yes. But there's fewer people. So I, 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 unfortunately, I think that's the way it's been designed. And with an account-based pension, you just can't get any, any more out of it because it's in your name. That's all you've got. Yeah. With a lifetime pension, the longer you live, the more you get. So you um, mentioned. So you, you know, mentioned North. You mentioned. North uh, Q, the old Q Super's got one. Generation yeah, Life yeah. got something. I've seen some material from from them. Is yeah, are they the three? Is there, is there any other products that you're aware of in the in the market that are doing this kind of thing? You know, the, there's probably half a dozen if you look round. Yeah, right. But you find that the the shareholder driven companies, the life companies, are more interested in doing this because they're looking for a, d- a dollar for the shareholders. Yes. But really, the, the super funds are mostly mutual. You know, the big industry funds, they're the ones that should be looking after their members more. Yep. But they see it, oh, they, I guess the problem for the super funds is the members tell them, we don't know what an annuity is or a pension, so we don't want it. And even those that have had it explained to them, they say, no, I'd rather have the money. I'd rather have the money than an income. So we have a great lot of education. And this is where the planners come in, of course, mm. uh, read our book. There's quite a job for planners to educate people. The, Senator Nick Sherry, he was going to introduce legislation to make it mandatory for super funds to show on their annual statements the estimated amount of income they would get in retirement. So you might say, this is your account balance now. This is yes. your estimated account balance at retirement, and that will buy you a lifetime income of so much. Yep. But that 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 never got through. It's a it's a good thing to do. In other countries, we have that. Yeah, that would be helpful. So you mentioned you mentioned a book. You've so talk talk to me about the book that you've you've written. What what's that about? Yeah, we, we saw planners as being the most important part in this. The the life insurers, the super funds aren't, you know, playing the role that they're meant to. But planners, the ones that we relate to and rub shoulders with, that they're onto this. They see this as um, a new thing to do. It's a new product. It's okay. It's been around for two thousand years, but it's sort of new to Australia. Yeah. So they're very interested, and they're going to their existing clients. A lot of them are over age sixty-five. 
they're still on account-based pensions and they're talking to them. And these are the people, because they've lived so long already, that think, what if I run out of money? I've been running down on money. What if I run down even more? I'd like to buy, I'd like to reinsure my longevity and I'll yeah. buy a lifetime pension or annuity. So we th we think planners are really important. We wrote this book for planners, not not for the man in the street. Yeah. Um, and, and the whole thing, because I'm, I'm a, I've passed my diploma in financial planning. So as the the other writers, Peter Rowe and Jim Hennington, we, we've all done it. So it, it was easy for us to write the book. And in there, you'll find things like, as a planner, you will all, already have considered this, 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 and this. But here's a few more tips. Boom, boom, boom. Yep. So yeah, and the examples are very in chapter six. They're the ones that I like the most because they show you how much better off people can be in in retirement. Oh, apart apart from just the finances, the other aspect to this uh, is that the I think we mentioned in the book. I'm not too sure, but. A major university in the US has run a survey for like 20 or so years, very large numbers of people, and they ask, what's important to you in retirement? Now, statistically speaking, there's only three things, and they are, in order, health. And of course, it's got to be health. You know, people want to be healthy. If you're not healthy, you're not going to enjoy life. Health is a number one. Number two, it's the amount of money. Oh, yeah, okay, fine, I understand that. You know, the more money you have, the more holidays you can have, the more hobbies and all that sort of stuff. And the third one is having an income in the form of a lifetime income. So, and, and it's marginally, well, not marginally, it's significantly ahead of having an account-based pension or investing in the assets yourself. Yep. And I know talking to... Uh, people in state government schemes that they want lifetime pensions they, they understand and they won't give them up so my cousin for example he, he's he's uh, in south australia but he he never talks about money never he is because he gets money deposited in his bank account every month it's not an issue for him but his his brother-in-law does talk about money because he's got an account-based pension and he's investing the money effectively himself. Yes. So it's it's an issue for him. It's an interesting point you highlight yeah. there because if I think about reflecting on clients that I've worked with over the years, like those that have access to a defined benefit pension scheme, they all know about it. They all and, and a lot of people tend to gravitate towards it. Yeah, it's interesting that if I think of some clients that yeah, there's there is clearly less money worries with those that do have the defined benefit pension and they might have some other money that they can top up that they, they can use for lump sums for the caravan and things like you like you mentioned. It hadn't dawned on me until you mentioned it compared to those that are just living off the account-based pension that are a lot more worried about it lasting and only want to spend the income and only want to take their 4 or 6% out of their minimum pensions. <laughs> yeah, well, I think the other thing is, people, I think there's only three... Three major things you need in retirement, from a money point of view, uh, you want an income that's high enough that you can live really well. Um, you want access to cash so that you can, if you want to buy a new car, you can just go out and do it. Yep. And thirdly, you want to leave a legacy to your children. Yeah. Um, so, so let's let's deal with the second and the third. Access to cash can come by having private investments. Or you just take some of your pension and put it in a savings vehicle, a non-super savings vehicle. So you can build up, you want a new car, just save up over a over year, say, or whatever, out of your lifetime pension income. Yep. So access to cash is really important to everybody because if we want to buy a new car or go to hospital and have operations, we need that money to be able to get us through. So access to cash is important, but you don't need everything in cash or liquid form. Yep. The other one is the legacy to your children. And I guess in my generation, we're looking at our children and think, my God, are these our children? <laughs> they, they have different mindsets. They're not working nearly as hard as we do. And they're, 
eating smashed avocados. We didn't have those in our day. We used to eat bread and <laughs> jam. So, uh, uh, yeah. but still, people want to leave money to their kids. So th that's a, an important thing. So I, I always think, I think my parents left me a house and a, and a bit of money. So I'm going to do that for my kids. But I don't think I need to leave them any more than that. I'll, I'll yes. get, I'll leave to them what I was left. Um, but I think my generation want to do even more than that. But really, we need to help them with education, and not not necessarily depriving ourselves. So in my case, when my parents were really old, I just said to them, "Hey, look, I'm not doing really well at the moment, but I will ultimately." So just. You don't need, I don't need your money. You use it all. Please mm. use mm. it all. Go on a world trip, buy a new car, do whatever you want. Go to have wild parties. But they didn't. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, but that's a, that's the thought, isn't it? Your yes. parents have only got 10, 15, 20 years left to live. You've got 40, 50, 60 years to live. Yes. So make sure they, uh, so the legacy thing may, I think, has got less of an impact now than it used to have. Mm hmm. How would you suggest planners start to think about legacy when they're using these these new types of products? Because there's you know there's some of them that that when you die the money's gone essentially it it, it funds the pool of, of the rest of the rest of everyone else. How how do you think we should tackle the the legacy piece for clients where that is a a big priority for them? Yeah, that that's probably. The best question you've asked today, Jim, because it's the hardest. Yeah. So um, what people have always been aware of in lifetime annuities, you go out on the highway and you get run over by a bus. Well, I go out on the highway and I don't see that many buses, but there are so many ways to, to end your life now. Um, and, and sometimes we don't know that it's coming, um, but lo life doesn't, it's not just risk-free. So the modern annuity designs have done something to answer that very question. And the two life insurers that I'm unaware of, they provide what's called a money back. Um, mm -hmm. A guy called Peter Hawkes, uh, he's a fam famous planner, he told me about this. He said, you've got to have money back. And what a money back means is that if you die say, before your life expectation, and you may not have got back all of the money that you invested. Yep. So what you get on your debt, or your state gets on your death, is the difference between what you invested and what you've been paid to date. Okay. So you get your money back, but you don't get an investment return on your money back. Yep. So it makes the investor in a lifetime annuity or pension feel a, li bit, a little bit better Mm. that uh, they haven't wasted their money. They might have wasted investment earnings on it, which might have been taxable or whatever, but um, they've got their money back. So that, that makes them feel a bit better about it. Gotcha. Okay. Anything else? Every final question, we'll kind of wrap, wrap up, but anything else that we should be thinking about uh, as planners to, I guess, educating the public um, and if we start to start to work through uh, work through these new products with with clients. Anything else that you can think of? Gee, there's probably tons of things. Um, yeah. Like the, I think planners really don't understand. Well, the, some of them do, but it's like what's happening within in an annuity. So I get comments like, "Oh yes, but on somebody's death, the life insurance company keeps it and they make enormous profits." Yeah. Well, no, they that's true. The life insurance company keeps it but they don't make enormous profits. They actually need that money to pay for the people that live a long time. So like the annuity business is probably the most dangerous business for life insurers because people are living longer. Yeah. And you think of some of the things that are going on now, like the, in the gene technology, if we can change our genes so we remove something that's in our family, so maybe people die of cancer at age 70 in our family, if we can get that gene and change it, that will help people live even longer. So I think um, from the manufacturer's point of view, the reinsurance is a good thing, but also from consumer's point of view, 
you've got like you insure your house, your car, your boat, you, you insure everything in your life pretty well. Why not insure your lifestyle post retirement? And if you take an annuity, you a lifetime annuity, you get an exact match between how long you'll need the money and how long you'll get it. There's no mismatch to the yeah. exact things. Yeah. So it's the ideal product. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Well, David, look, thanks for joining me this afternoon. Pleasure having you on the on the podcast. I've certainly learned a lot. Hopefully anyone listening has done too. If, if anyone wants to pick up a copy of your book or, or pick your brain on anything, where, where can people find you? Uh, it's on amazon.com.au. It's called okay. Retirement Income for Life. Yeah. Yeah, Retirement Income for Life, Solving the Longevity Equation. And that's a bit of a joke for us actuaries because there's no such thing as a longevity equation. <laughs> it sounds good. <laughs> good for the title. Fantastic. Well, thanks, David. Pleasure speaking with you. Thanks, James. Take care.